previous you can uh, uh, in, i mean sir we can stop presenting so that bajaj can put his uh, yes, ppt sir. yes sir bajaj you can start presenting your ppt your uh, header yes, slide yeah. yep We'll wait for another few minutes and start. Sounds good. Ah, uh, now our uh, time is uh, just one, one or two minutes, huh? So just just. Take Now we will we'll start in another two minutes. अगले वेन है ना स्टार्ट पनी लगा में दे रिकॉर्डिंग पार्टिसिपेंट्स ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ आईटीपीली सीएस मेट्रास जीसीएम चेन्नई एंड सीएसई चेन्नई वी कॉर्डिली इनवाइट यू टू अ वेबिनार ऑन हाउ नो कोड इज चेंजिंग द वे वी बिल्ड सॉफ्टवेयर बाय मिस्टर जगदीश बजाज एंटरप्रेन्योर एंड नो कोड कंसलटेंट टोरंटो कनाडा द फ्यूचर ऑफ कोडिंग इज नो कोडिंग एट ऑल दिस इज स्टेटेड बाय मिस्टर क्रिस वांस क्रॉक Keyword GitHub. The demand for software far exceeds the supply of coders. No code development platforms are empowering the citizen developer to take innovation, software development, mm -hmm. and app development into their own hands. As every business becomes a software business, the no code revolution is well underway and is changing the way we build software. Not just how, but it is also changing who builds the software. Mr. Jagdish Bajaj will. present how no code is changing the way we build this software and answer some of the key questions and challenges this disruption brings with it mr jagdish is an entrepreneur with a strong background in information technology where he started his career as a programmer and moved up into several it executive and product management roles in global organizations around the world he has led software development and operation teams to deliver world class solutions built and deployed mission critical software systems and help to meet enterprise objectives to enhance business outcomes he is passionate about the no code space and how it is enabling on enterprises to become more agile while also creating a new wave of entrepreneurship and disruption jagdish has built several no code solutions for multi sided 
market places, CRM and sales enablement, workflow management, job costing and volunteer management for non-profits. Among other things, Jagdish runs build and launch boot camps for entrepreneurs and business owners to learn how to turn their ideas into a web app in eight short weeks, even if they don't have a technical background. Jagdish is a creative problem solver and is able to communicate and implement new ideas for business process improvement. His core competencies include software and technology management, business analysis, revenue and cost measurement, and KPIs and metric management. Additionally, Mr. Jagdish has volunteered at multiple organizations and is passionate about giving back to the community. He served as Vice President at the Indo-Canada Chamber of Commerce in Toronto and Director of Events at the Singhi Cultural Association of Toronto, to name a few. He has a Bachelor's of Commerce degree from the University of Madras and completed his MBA from the University of Hull in the UK. Over to Mr. Jagdish Bajar. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to be presenting to IEEE, ACM, and CSI chapters in Chennai, which is actually my hometown. I was born in Chennai and spent a uh, lot of my uh, young life in Chennai. And uh, welcome to many of you joining from other parts uh, of the world as well. My name is Jagdish Bajaj, and I'm going to talk to you about how no code is changing the way software is built. As we just heard, the no code revolution is well underway and it's changing not just the way we build software, but also, more importantly, who builds software. So before I get into the presentation, I'd just like to take a moment to thank my, my dear friend, Mr. H.R. Mohan, for uh, inviting me to uh, make this, uh, this presentation. I'd also like to thank uh, Mr. P.V. Subramanian, chair of the CSI Chennai chapter, and Dr. P. Sattivel, chair of the IEEC CS Madras. So let's get right into it. Um, we've already uh, heard a bit about me. I won't go into much detail, except that I've started uh, my no-code journey a few years ago. And in this presentation, I'll, I'll tell you how I came across it and how I uh, have started, uh, have started uh, uh, you know, evangelizing no-code, if that's the way to put it. So here's the agenda. We I have about I have you for about uh, 55 to 60 minutes. So what we're going to do is uh, I'll go through a quick no code presentation. It's it's packed with information and insights for about 30 minutes. Then I'm going to do a live demo using a no code tool called Bubble, which is the tool that I use most of the time. We'll take about 15 to 20 minutes, uh, depending on how much uh, time we have. And then uh, we'll open up for question and answers for about, about 10 minutes. Some of you have already sent some questions, so I'll answer those first. And in between the live demo and the Q&A, uh, if we have some time, I have a one to two minute video to show you about no code. Let me start off with a quote. Thomas Edison, the inventor of the light bulb, said, there is a, a way to do it better. Let's find it. So... Right off the top, let's talk about what is no code, right? So there are many definitions, but this is the one that I that I really like. Um, it basically allows people who are programmers and non-programmers to create software using a graphical user interface and some configuration instead of traditional hand-coded computer programming, which involves uh, learning and understanding lots and lots of syntax. And as we also heard in the introduction, the term non-programmer in the enterprise uh, world has another phrase as well, and, and that phrase is citizen developer, which also you'll hear a lot in the no-code space. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to start with the end. So these are the conclusions I want to leave you with at the end of this presentation. One, I believe no-code is here to stay. Two. The benefits of no-code are real. Three, no-code is an edge. And four, no-code is an equalizer. And, and we'll touch on all of these uh, during the presentation. Now, we are in the midst of COVID. COVID is, has come, but it hasn't gone entirely yet. But even before COVID, software has really been at the heart of all commerce and so many things that we do in our lives as consumers. Software indeed rules the world. 
every single aspect of our life involves software in some way. And uh, I like to say that code is at the heart of commerce in the modern world today. Since the emergence of the internet, our lives now revolve around being connected all the time. It's funny, when we receive guests who were staying with us for a few days, the first thing that they want to know when they enter the house is, what is your Wi-Fi password? Because we do our banking, shopping, learning, meeting, like this one, investing, traveling, consuming, eating, even watching movies has now moved online. And this connectedness makes life quite convenient, actually, which explains why today's consumer wants to do everything digitally, right? And user experience has become the key. Enterprises today have to compete at the user experience level, not just with products, pricing, or distribution alone. And this is even more true after the onset of COVID-19. The virus has further increased the speed of enterprises and governments who continue the pace of innovation and digitizing their business processes. And the winners are those who give consumers and other businesses what they expect, a rich, smooth, satisfying user experience in the digital space. And software is the mechanism to deliver world-class user experiences. So let's turn the clock back briefly to see how software is built and how did we get here. So we all know the history of computing, and so I won't bore you with uh, you know, a long story there. But we are aware of the remarkable technological progress that our generation has witnessed. So let's just take a quick one-minute recap in the context of how software came about. So originally, we started coding using machine language, zeros and ones, then uh, we made it easier and abstracted into assembly language, then further into languages like C, Java, Python, etc. At each step of this journey, the goal was to make life easier for the software developer. And do in doing this, we moved away from the metal, and each step made coding a bit easier than before. And that was a good progression. But that progression did not last because software development after the internet came along has changed the paradigm of software development completely. What used to be mainly internal applications, now software is used to create interconnected applications. From a waterfall model, we have now progressed to agile and hyper agile, where software is released sometimes every week. Uh, there are some companies that do multiple releases in a single day. Uh, what and in the past it used to be you know you release software after you, after one or two years of uh, product development. So from taking years to build, we are now at months and weeks. From a simple one device form factor, we are now in the age of device multiplicity. From mainly on-premise solutions, we've moved to the cloud in a big way, and hybrid is also becoming an option. From software that could be isolated once upon a time, we are now at a point where APIs are the norm and software cannot live on an island anymore. So in other words, complexity has become the norm. So for someone to learn software development in the 1960s or even 1980s was a matter of learning a single language. And once you learned that one language, it was quite easy to become productive as a programmer. But that has changed. The life of a software developer has changed dramatically since the dawn of computing. And how has that changed? The main reason for this is that there has been an explosion in languages, frameworks, and technologies. So take my example. As a programmer who started in the 1980s, all I had to do was learn, uh, learn a language, and my choice at that time was COBOL. And I was able to write business software with just that one skill. So I still remember the ancillary technologies that I needed to learn were few and far between. Over the years, I you know, learned a bit of Unix, uh, some shell scripting, and some relational databases and stuff like that. And that was it. Now, the internet came along 25 to 30 years ago and changed everything. Because look on the slide. Look at the languages and technologies needed to be learned today to build software. And we all know that this is not a complete list by any means. There are so many other things that are not on this slide. But as a developer, today, one has to learn an alphabet soup of technologies right, in order to build software that's, that's useful. And what is even more is that 
a developer in 2021 is actually found in three separate bodies one for building front end a second for developing the middle layer and a third person who specializes in coding the back end server side logic so sometimes a full stack developer will do all three but there's a lot to learn because of the complexity of software uh, that has become the norm since the internet came along now it's not just the complexity even before complexity became what it is the shortage of professional developers has always been there and it's become even more acute right even before the internet became a thing so some people say that uh, in the us there is a shortage of 4 million software developers currently right and it's not that we're not producing graduates in in high numbers we are so despite new graduates shortage is still persist so fang which is an acronym for facebook amazon apple netflix netflix and google they are driving hiring in large numbers among other large enterprises and uh, like like it was said in the introduction every company is now heading towards becoming a software company because software is really where the competitive edge is being hardwired into every business and as a result of that more and more people want to hire software developers and the complexity of software development continues to add to the shortage that already exists but here's the bigger problem right less than 1% of the world's population can write computer code the actual number is more like 0.3% So think about that for a second. Three only three people out of every 1000 human beings can actually write software. Right? So the developers who develop software, they create applications that non-developers consume. Right? So this is the ratio between the creators and the consumers. The tiny number on your screen is the actual number of people or the estimated number of people that can write computer code. now software development has a let's take a look at how software development has has evolved from a different point of view right so in the 60s if you had to be a software developer you needed access to a large bulky computer in a secure air conditioned facility you would uh, write code by hand on paper use a card punch feed it into a computer and hope and pray that it works so in a strange way in 2021 software developers life has become easy in some ways right there is absolutely no shortage of tools most platforms languages packages frameworks are free anyone can download python flask react ruby on, on rails microsoft's dotnet platform swift or the android sdk and start writing software even if there is a cost to some of these things the cost is pretty nominal so the tools are available but the key takeaway is that software development itself has become so much more complex that access to tools is of the trade have become easier but actually practicing the craft itself has become quite complex right so the real barrier to software development is complexity so here is the perfect time to tell you my story So I started my life as a software developer in the 1980s. Um I learned a bit of basic then cobol and stuff like that. Then after I moved uh, out of India I went to Hong Kong for a bit. I moved up the ladder into management roles. Uh this was in uh, the early 90s. And I in the in my management career I was not doing any more coding. But I was still curious to know how HTML worked and missed the satisfaction of writing computer code but I didn't really spend any time exploring coding at any level even as a hobby but that desire to create something continued to percolate inside me so around 2013 I became serious about learning how to build software again I was determined to get back uh and and write code I started with HTML JavaScript it was a bit challenging but it was manageable Then I moved on to learning Ruby on Rails, some more JavaScript and frameworks like Meteor. Uh, I'm not sure if they're still around. And at the same time I was also grappling to get familiar with Heroku, Git and and other things that you need to actually deploy an application. 
And I knew at that time I was only scratching the surface and would need to learn a lot more to be able to build software again. That's when I realized that learning how to code has become insanely complex. So in 2013, I failed. I failed at learning Ruby on Rails, HTML, JavaScript, and Meteor. I couldn't really climb that steep learning curve. Luckily, I came across no code in 2018, and, the, and like they say, the rest is history. With no code, I, I discovered that anyone can build software in a much faster time frame and obviously at a much lower cost. Of course, there are some caveats, all right? No code is not the magic wand uh, solution to everything. It has its limitations. Not every software can be built using uh, no code, but a large portion of business applications absolutely can be built with no code. But you may be wondering, so uh, why did I want to start coding again? And the reason is that the desire to create is universally human. We are makers, builders, and tinkerers. Our itch to create and innovate is what has brought us here today in our modern world. We love to find problems in our environment and solve them. And there are creators everywhere. One of my bootcamp students is an orthopedic surgeon from Boston. He wanted a way to build an app to capture rotator cuff injuries for himself and his fellow doctors, so he just built it. Another of my students is a, is a hobbyist. They're actually a pair of Toronto founders. They're building a marketplace for comic books. So without no code, they absolutely won't be able to do it. Like most people, they don't have traditional programming skills. And like most people, they don't have $100,000 lying around to build a custom coded solution. So they are building it themselves. Yet another team is based in Colombia, and they're building an app to connect sports trainers, facilities, and players. So the urge to create is inside all of us. And no code is a way for many of us to express that creativity. So then the next question is, so why build with no code? Why not just learn how to code? And the answer to that is, or I should say one answer to that is, Writing code is not everyone's cup of tea, right? Nor, it is, nor is it something that everyone wants to do, especially business users. As a business user, say in the finance department, I want to create a spreadsheet and do my projections, my profit and loss account, and so on. I don't really want to learn coding to the extent where I can create something like Excel. I just want to use something like Excel. So I was reading an article, Satya Nadella, of, uh, CEO of uh, Microsoft, this is exactly what he was saying. Uh, he was saying that no code tools are going to enable people who want to build a solution without having to actually learn everything about how the underlying software works. Right? Now I must say here that learning how to code, learning how to write computer code will obviously continue because here's here's the point. For professional software developers, all this complexity that I've been talking about, all this, you know, learning curve, steep learning curve, all this stuff, for professional software developers, all this is nothing. Pro developers are very comfortable with complex code. So uh, the funny thing is my son is a software developer, uh, and he's in a third-year university, and he's learning how to write and already uh, working at a at a fintech startup here in Toronto, and he's writing conventional code. So if I tell him that that learning how to write code is uh, complex, uh, I get I get some some very strange looks. So <laughs> it is not complex for those who can grasp it, right? So uh, that will definitely continue on its own. Now. There's also a middle ground. So I've come across some software development teams who are uh, offering professional software development services to clients. And they're also considering using no code because no code saves them time and time is money. So what no code really does is it gives people with little or no technical background the ability to build software. What it's really doing is it's making software development more inclusive. Because as a society, if we only rely on people who know how to code, we are leaving a lot of innovations on the table. Some of those innovations will never see the light of day. So because code is the real barrier for many. 
So next question is, who can benefit from no code? So the answer is everyone from solo founders all the way to governments can benefit from no code. Not, and I shouldn't say can benefit, they are benefiting from no code already. The primary benefits, as you can see on the slide, are lower cost of development and a faster time to market. Especially during COVID, time to market has been a critical factor for everyone, including for governments. Now, we are, we are not used to using the word government and time to market in the same sentence because we tend to think of governments as being slow, right? But as we've seen in the last year, uh, and hats off to all the governments around the world because governments have acted pretty fast overall, and digitization has played a vital role in the global COVID response. So these benefits accrue to everyone, really. Um, on the fourth line on the slide, so, so a, a domain expert, let's say in the finance department, can now become a citizen developer and help to alleviate some of the pressure that IT departments are facing and then freeing up pro developers to focus on higher value projects. So this is a broad understanding of who can benefit from no code. But if we dig a little further, I think as a society as a whole, we're probably going to derive a lot more value than we can see on this slide because with lower development costs means lower innovation costs, which means higher efficiency, better competitiveness, more growth, and at the enterprise level, more resilience as well. So next, let's take a, a quick peek at the no-code tool landscape. Right. So tools in the no-code space are typically found in some of these categories. So on the at the at the basic end, there are website builders like Wix, Webflow, Squarespace, and Shopify. Although Shopify uh, is not just a website builder, it has a lot of commerce uh, and shopping capability built in. But most of these uh, tools are uh, produce a static site with with some database and and logic uh, included. Just below that, at the bottom mm -hmm. left corner you'll see connectors and databases. These are tools uh, where you can connect to applications that were not designed to talk to each other. And that's what uh, tools like Zapier and Parabola do. Uh, Airtable is an interesting one. It uh, it offers a, a database backend which can be connected to so many different uh, no-code tools. In the center, some examples of uh, mobile and voice app builders. Uh, which produce either a native or a web app uh, for mobile with, with a little bit of database and logic capabilities, tools like Adalo, Thunkable, Glide, VoiceFlow, and Andromo. On the right side, you see web apps, uh, web app builders, uh, like Bubble, Coda, Retool. And of course, the, the big players are in the game as well. This... Uh, paper airplane that you see, that's the logo of uh, AppSheet, which is a Google product. And on the right side is Honeycode, which is an Amazon product. Uh, there are also some very specific uh, no-code tools that are aimed at the larger enterprises. And these are some of them, Betty Blocks, Uncork. Uncork was started by the CIO, former CIO of MetLife. And uh, one of the case studies I'm going to talk to you about was built by Appify. Oh, and uh, Drona HQ is an Indian company based in uh, Mumbai offering a no-code development platform. So the next uh, question is, what can we build with no-code, right? Um, Pretty much just about any kind of, of business application, social networks, um, CRMs, inventory management, marketplaces. I've seen messaging apps, workflow apps, e-health apps. All kinds of apps can be built using no code. So um, let's now talk about some case studies, right? Who has actually used no code, built with no code, and succeeded with no code. There are hundreds and hundreds of examples. But I've picked uh, three to discuss today, and I think there's some, um, uh, there is a question in the Q&A as well, which I'll, which I'll answer. So the first case study we're going to look at is this company called PS Jewelers. Now, 
they are a jewelry store that has been around since 1896 and they're based in Tirutani. So the young generation owner, who is the fifth generation owner of the store, decided to build a, a simple, very simple inventory and customer service application themselves using uh, Google Apps Sheet plus uh, Google Sheets plus Zapier. So they have now created uh, an interesting way to communicate with their customers and send customized SMS messages after a visit to their store is complete or a purchase is complete. So this is a simple example of uh, no code in action. Here's another one. So Tata MD, they turned to Appify for a quick and effective solution to deliver rapid COVID-19 testing results, something only a no code platform could possibly provide because of the insane time frame that they had. So Appify was able to deliver a set of five apps in just five weeks. Uh, and this was a complete end-to-end -end solution with multiple apps that includes a complex set of functionality running across all parts of the COVID testing value chain. I see some questions in the chat. Please keep them coming. I will get to them and answer them uh, once the presentation is completed. So the next case study is this company called Income E. So this is... Uh, a solo founder who used Bubble to create a very simple invoicing app for freelancers. And um, he's based in Europe. It was built by one person. And I think they have about, uh, if I'm not mistaken, 2,500 to 3,000 users right now. So these are just some quick case studies. And I have two more, which I'll, I'll uh, cover in the, in the Q&A section. So here's another question. What can we not build with no code? So like I said earlier, no code is not the answer to, to all problems. There are plenty of uh, examples of software that cannot be built, at least currently using no code platforms. Um, you know, there are lots of examples. Like let's say for instance, if you wanted to build a high performance uh, game or uh, browser plugins, uh, load balancers, encryption tools, artificial intelligence apps, any kind of embedded applications, robotics, software, crypto tools, uh, any high performance applications with millions of users, you know, those sort of things cannot be built with no code. Uh, or I should say at least today, they cannot be built with no code. So this is a big question. Uh, when we started, uh, just before the webinar started, uh, there was uh, some conversation going on with uh, Mr. Mohan and, and one other gentleman. Does no code mean that there'll be no no more developers? Of course not. No code tools themselves are built by professional software developers. So without a pro developer, even no code, the concept itself cannot exist. So what is going to happen is pro developers are going to continue to move their skills up the value chain and build though all those things that cannot be built with no code, including building the fabric of all the platforms uh, that will be in the no-code space. What no-code is going to do, it's, it's going to only empower business users, startups, to quickly build their own apps with minimum uh, minimal involvement from IT teams that can now focus on the higher value projects that can make you know, a much higher impact uh, for the enterprise. Because at the end of the day, if you think of how software is built, Let's take a simple example of authentication, right? Just logging and logging out a user into an app. That uh, that set of code, that process has to be built by hand every single time an app is built. And uh, the idea is that pro developers can focus their time on higher value tasks instead of writing one more log in, log out routine. Now, no code isn't without its challenges, right? There are a lot of challenges to implementation, and these are some of them, right? So let's start with security. That's probably the biggest challenge because if you use a, a no-code tool in an, in an enterprise and suddenly a business user wants to access data that's sitting you know, well-guarded behind a firewall and so on, uh, so that access to data and how it's actually going to be provisioned must be well-planned and executed to maintain the security of, of that data. 
Uh, culture is a challenge. So what uh, organizations have seen is where there is innovation uh, hardwired into the culture of the organization, that's where no code seems to be gaining the most ground. Number three, on the third on the right side, management buy-in. Uh, goes without saying, but I wanted to put it there. The C-suite has to buy in. Uh, that is essential for any no-code implementation to succeed. Uh, project management. So one, we must not lose sight of the fact that implementing no-code in an organization or building no-code or whatever is uh, not any different from any other projects. So our, our normal... Uh, governance of projects and, and the planning and management and monitoring and KPIs are essential for success. Um, so that, you know, we don't get carried away that, that no code is this, is this beautiful new shiny thing that's going to come and solve all our problems. No, it's, it's not. It needs uh, to be project managed like any other project. And last but not the least, IT buy-in is also required, right? For a no-code initiative to go far within an organization, it must have IT support. It must have IT involvement, uh, basically across the board, in order for the project to uh, to succeed. So now we come back uh, to the very beginning, right? These are the conclusions I wanted to leave you with at the end of this presentation, and. So here, it, here they are again. No code is here to stay. And as we've seen, the momentum has only increased since COVID. A lot of governments, private organizations, so many solutions. As early as April or May of last year, I saw many no code um, solutions from the simple to the complex being implemented uh, as a part of the COVID response. No code benefits are real. Uh, who doesn't want to save time or save costs or conserve IT resources? Right, no code is an edge for startups and enterprises alike, uh, and particularly for startups. You know, people who have ideas, and those are the people that I work with most uh, most of the time. People who have an idea, no code is definitely an edge. So, um, people without a coding background are now able to build their own own apps for their own startup. Uh, for enterprises, again, I have another case study which I'll show you in a few minutes. It's a huge edge uh, to reduce time to market and improve um, competitiveness. And lastly, no code is an equalizer because uh, it enables people with uh, fewer resources to also build, create, and turn their ideas into startups. So there will be more innovation and more inclusion as a result of uh, this trend. So now uh, with this, the presentation piece is concluded and we're going to move into a live demo now. So perhaps what I'll do is, um, maybe I'll show you the video now and then come back to, and then come back to the Q&A in a second. So give me one moment and I'm gonna share, this is a very short one and a half minute video. Uh, by a company called Webflow, and uh, they ran a no-code conference a while ago. This is uh, the video that, that's from that conference. Today, the world runs on code. Every text you send, every website you visit, every screen you swipe, it's all driven by code. Code that only a fraction of the world can even understand. And that's a problem. Imagine if only one out of every 400 people knew how to write. Think how many world-changing ideas would have never seen the light of day. We'd be stuck in the dark ages. And when it comes to software development, we kind of are. So what if, instead of writing hundreds of lines of code to add new features to your website, you could just design them directly on your website? What if you could create the next world-changing product without writing a single line of code? That's the future for creators, and it's about to change everything. It's time to unleash the power of software development to everyone by making it visual, 
So anyone can harness the power of code to build a website, an app, or an entire business without actually writing it. At Webflow, we're doing exactly that. We're empowering creators to design, build, and launch amazing things. No code required. Welcome to the future of software development. Welcome to the age of no code. So, Mr. Mohan, should we do the Q&A now or should we go into the demo? Uh, it will be better <coughs> that you conduct the demo, then we'll take okay. out the q &A. All right, sounds good. So this is, uh, what you're looking at now is Bubble. Bubble is a no-code uh, platform and I'm going to run through this really, really quickly. Um, in about 10 minutes, I'm going to try and build an app. So let's call this my to-do app. Put my name there. So once you create an app in the bubble environment, what it does is it um, gives you a few components that are already there, like for instance, uh, authentication, logging in and logging out users, creating a user account. Some functionality is already built in. And I'm gonna start with a blank page, right? The idea here is just to get, just to show you how quickly one can put an application together. So this page is blank, there's nothing there. Uh, and Bubble essentially lets you do the front-end user design, define workflows, and create databases, all from one single user interface. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to very quickly start creating my app. I'm going to call this my to-do app. So almost every no-code tool has a lot of styling capability. You can specify sizes and colors and fonts and so on. Um, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to add a button. When the user hasn't logged in yet, I'm going to say uh, sign up. So remember, this is what the user is actually going to see. So this is the front end. And uh, what Bubble lets us do is take any element on the front end and attach a workflow to it. So I'm, and so and most of the most of what you see is going to be like English phrase like uh, descriptions, right? So it says when button sign up is clicked, what do we want to do? There are some account functions that are built in where we're saying um, we're going to say uh, we're going to say show the sign in and login pop up, which is an element that's built into Bubble, and I'm going to just drop it on this page. This is a component that already is uh, comes with the platform, so you don't have to build it. In the workflow, I'm going to say when someone signs up, when clicks on sign up, let's show, let's show the user the sign in and login pop up, and I'm going to hit preview. So when I hit preview, what it's going to do is actually going to execute the application, so this is what the user will see. So when I click on the sign up button, the pop-up appears, right? So that's all we've built so far. Let's go back into the builder and continue building. Um, what I wanna do is I wanna I want the user to be able to create a list of their own um, action items, right? So let's look at the component that comes with Bubble, the sign in, login pop-up. It also has some workflows, right? When the user clicks on the sign up button, let's see what's actually happening. What Bubble is doing is it's signing the user up. And once that sign in uh, is completed using the email and password, then it basically tells the interface to hide that pop up. What we're going to do after this is I'm going to ask Bubble to take me to a new page, which I'm going to create called My To Do. That's a new page that we're going to ask Bubble to create. And let's 
go to that page, which has already been created for us. It's a blank page again. And on this page, I'm going to add a text box, right? That says, welcome, followed by the current user's email address, right? And here, what we're going to do is on this page, we're going to add something called a repeating group, which is going to be a list of all a list of all the tasks that the user has created for themselves, right? Inside the repeating group, there's going to be a text element, which has the, it's going to say the current cells thing. Oh, actually, you know what I should do? I should probably create my database first. So let me go to the data tab. We already have a user that's uh, a built-in data type inside Bubble. I can create a new data type called to do. That data type is going to have the task name, which is a text type, and a due date, which is a date type, and a flag. Yes or no? So in my workflow, um, or I should say in my design, I'm going to say this text, I want it to be, or actually this repeating group, I want it to be the uh, to-do list, right? And uh, the data source has to come from the current user. So what we're going to do is on the user, we're going to add another field called uh, to-do list, which is, the to-do data type that we just created. So, and what I've done with a few uh, with a few clicks here is established a one-to-many relationship. So for those of you who may be familiar with entity relationship diagrams, this might ring a bell. So we're basically connecting the user data type to the to-do data type uh, with a one-to-many relationship. And that's what this, uh, this does. In our design, we're going to say that the page type of content is to-do. And whoever is logged in, the current user, that person's to-do list, we wanted to show in this repeating group. And the text element here is going to be the current cells to-do's task name. We're just gonna copy and paste that over on the side. Let me actually make this wider so we have a little more room. So we have the description. Then we have, then we're going to quickly change this to to do's due date, and we're going to format it as readable as we want it to be. And then our next field is going to be. Our next field is going to be the actual status of that task. So we can tell whether the task is completed or not. It is complete. And that's it. So we also need a way for users to add a task. So at the bottom of this page, I'm going to add a text field Sorry, not a text field, but let's add an input field at the bottom for a user to type in name of the task. Right? And then what we're going to do is we're going to add another field, another input field. Actually, let me just copy and paste this. This next field is going to be a date type. Maybe better to use this element, date and time picker, which will actually open up a calendar, right? And then we're going to add a button on the right side, which the user can click on in order to add the task to their task list. So when the user clicks on that add button, what we want to do is we're going to say, uh, 
in the set of actions as a choice uh, is a group called data where we can create a new thing. We're going to create a new to-do item. And initially, we're going to say complete is no. Due date is going to be the value that comes from the from the picking element. And the task name is going to come from the input field, which contains the name of that task. What we're also going to do is we're going to connect that data to the current user's list to-do list. We're going to add the record that we just created in the previous step. Right, and that's it. So let's look at, let's go back to our main page and see what happens when we hit preview, right? I don't know how long it's been. It's probably been about 10 minutes uh, for this build so far. So I click on sign up. I can create a uh, email address and password. So I'm just going to use my own email address. And I click on sign up. When I do that, it should take me to my to the page that has tasks. So let's see if this works. Um, finish no code presentation is my first task. The due date is let's say 22nd, and I click on add. Oh, here we go. It works. So in the database, it's added this. Um, task name and the due date, and also showing me that it's not completed. So let's say I create another one. I say, um, write client proposal. Let's say the due date for this is the 30th. I can say, uh, produce uh, initial draft of website. Due date is at 31st. I click on add. There we go. Now I want to show you. Now obviously there are some issues. Uh, the input field is not getting reset. Very, very easy to fix those kind of problems. I can just go into the workflow uh, for when the to-do is added, when the button add is created. I'm creating a new to-do, making changes to the user. All I have to do is reset inputs, and that problem is solved. Um, I want to show you the data. So most no-code tools will give you a way to quickly look at the data that's in your database. So if I look at, if I click on user and go to the app data, I can see that the user record has been created. If I go to the to-dos, I can see all the to-do records that have been created. Now we have a few minutes. Let me just quickly go in and see what other functionality can I add to that page. I'm going to expand this group a bit and just add a way to mark something as completed. So I'm gonna take an icon, right? And add it in the same row, right? And say, add a checkbox and start an edit, uh, start a workflow and say, when someone clicks on that checkbox, what we want to do is, we want to change the current cells to do, we want to change uh, complete to yes. Uh, what I also want to do is I'm going to, there's lots of powerful ways to, to improve the user interface. I mean, I've just done a very, very quick job here, but um, I'm going to, I'm going to convert all these and create a group out of them. And then I'm going to say, if add a condition and say, if, this uh, current cells to do complete is yes, then let's change the background style to a flat color and change the background color to, let's say, to green, something like that, right? So let's go in and see uh, what this functionality has changed. So it just took a couple of minutes to do it, right? A couple of minutes later, we now have a new version, which has the functionality that I just added. So there we go. That's the that's the button. First, let me try to add another task. So I'm adding one task for myself: answer all Q and A questions, which is coming up. The deadline to do this is right now, today. And let me click on add. 
So now you see the inputs are getting reset. So we fixed that problem. Let's say I finished writing the client proposal and I click on this icon here. And now the value of the, the field changed from no to yes and the background color has also changed. We can do all sorts of things. Maybe I don't want my uh, repeating group to show any items that are pending. So I can add something called a filter and ask the server to send me only records where completed is equal to no. Right? Let's see what happens. Okay, I broke something. Let's try that again. So complete is equal to, I should say complete is not equal to yes. Right? Let's see what happens. Okay, there we go. So now it's only showing the items that are not complete. So you get the idea, right? So when I click on click on any of these, it's going to that item is going to disappear from my list because now it's a completed task. So um, I want to save some time for the Q and A. I know there are a lot of questions, so I'm going to uh, switch to Q and A if that's if that's okay. I hope that gives you a, a good idea. We we spent about maybe 12 to 15 minutes on this uh, on building this app. And I think it's pretty remarkable uh, given the limited amount of time that we spent. So that was the live demo. Now we'll go into Q&A. Uh, so I'll start with the questions that um, were received before the uh, before the event, and then we will uh, we will answer the other questions that came in through the chat. So um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to thank all of you for being here anyway. So I'm going to leave this slide on while I answer the questions. Right, so you can grab my contact information, uh, take a picture. This is the next uh, boot camp that I'm launching on uh, one week from today. It's at at uh, ten in the morning. Eastern, 7.30 p.m. IST, it runs for eight weeks. So if anyone's interested, you can take a look at that. So let me now switch to the Q&A. So one of the questions was, uh, what exactly is no code? I hope uh, this presentation has answered that question. Uh, the second question that I have, uh, which came in a couple of days ago is, is coding hard? Um, so the answer to that question is very personal, uh, like we've been through before. For me, I think uh, coding in the internet uh, age is pretty hard. Uh, my son will not agree with me. So I think that's a question that uh, uh, you should answer for yourself. And if you can code, that's excellent, because the world needs as many professional software developers as we possibly can. Because like I said, None of the innovations that we're seeing today, not even no code, none of these things would exist without coding. So if you find it, uh, if you find that you can learn how to code, uh, please definitely do so. Um, the next question, okay, there are some comments. Yes, the next question was, would love to have one case study covered with outcomes assessed post deployment. So why don't we take a look at that? Um, I have a few, a couple more case studies that I can take you through. So we're going to talk about two case studies very quickly here. One is a startup. That's this one. It's a company called Coins. So what they did was they would uh, round off any amounts from your bank account and take those pennies or those paisas and move them aside so you can pay off uh, your debt or save for uh, you know something that you want to uh, do in the future. So uh, this app lets you connect your bank account to them, and then they take your money and set it aside to pay off your debt. So uh, this app was built with Bubble, and uh, I think a substantial portion of it still runs on Bubble at the moment. 
so this is one example uh and i'm going to give you one example with uh, with millions and one example with billions all right so this is the millions example now let's go into the billions example i came across uh, this case study and uh, was uh, you know uh, in a discussion with uh, with some people from stearns lending stearns lending they had a problem they had 5000 loan applications for mortgages for home loans that were uh that were in the pipeline and they had a, a huge backlog they were taking like 90 days to process a loan application because it's a large company you know billions of dollars uh, plenty of departments so they had the issue they had was was communication right sending uh, information from one department to another and emails and email attachments and uh you know documents provided by applicants and so on so they built their first no code app and they were with this platform trackvia and they were able to reduce their turnaround time from 90 days all the way down to 10 days which is remarkable and uh, over it took them about 6 months to do it but uh, they were able to make a huge difference uh, in their in their business so the next question is how configurable are the reusable codes and the configurable security measures also built in for the transactions during the execution of no code excellent question security is a very very important aspect um of uh, any software for that matter not just no code so let's take a look let me show you inside bubble there is a feature called privacy so i can set up simple privacy rules again without using any code so for instance the to do list i don't want anyone else to see my to do list and i don't want to see don't want to have the ability to see anyone else's to do list so there are simple ways to actually fence the data by defining rules so i'm going to call this rule own tasks only right and i create a rule and in that rule i can specify and say when the current user which is the user who's logged in is this to do's creator so the person who's actually created the to do list users who match this rule can view all fields find this in searches view attached files and everyone else i can turn off all access to data so by doing this what i'm effectively saying is uh that only the person who created that task that that to do item is the only person that can view fields once i do this and set it up then bubble automatically uh filters this data when someone's uh, looking at it and this is just a small example of how uh how you can configure security measures and i hope that answers that question um so the last question that i have uh on the questions that came before the event was how can no code help in building solutions for e-commerce so e-commerce was one of the pioneering applications when the when the internet uh, came around and the um most common example that's being used in the no code space today is uh, that of shopify because as you all know with shopify you can create a an online store without writing a single line of code so shopify is kind of a low code and a no code platform because shopify also allows uh, people who can code to write uh, to write their own code to customize the experience that shopify offers so shopify is one example but i've seen plenty of examples uh, of uh, people that have built entire marketplaces um online stores or even uh clones of shopify using no code tools so the answer to that question is no code can really help in building uh, solutions for e-commerce in just about any way that you can imagine anything uh, that you can think of uh in the e-commerce space it can be built uh, using no code because um i think no code is is kind of ideally suited to an e-commerce uh, type of application because you can do everything from cart management to catalog management product management user management payment processing 
notifications, uh, sending SMS, sending emails automatically, uh, maintaining a, you know, a, a uh, inventory system. All of these things can be done using any no-code tool. Um, I've seen it done in Bubble many times as well. So now I'm going to shift to the to the comments in the in the chat and see if we can quickly answer some of these questions. I may not know the answer to some of them, and if I don't, I'm just going to move past them, uh, just in the interest of time. Uh, is Airtable owned by Adobe? I think somebody answered that question later that it's not owned by Adobe, if I'm not mistaken. Um, where does Process Maker fit in this landscape? I'm not familiar with Process Maker. Um, so next question is, if no-code software development is fast and less costly, why should the big firms such as Apple, Google, Netflix, DCS, Infosys, Oracle hire high-paying software development engineers? That's an excellent question. Excellent question. I think what's going to happen is we're going to see a shift in the landscape. So companies like Apple, Google, Netflix, DCS, Infosys, Oracle, many companies, they're also building their own no-code and low-code platforms. So how the, it'll be interesting to see how, how the, the hiring of, of software development changes. Uh, but I also want to take you back to what Mr. Mohan said before the uh, event began. Um, there, is, there are obviously you know, many opinions out there, and one opinion is that for no code to become a part of the mainstream will take at least 10 years. Um, so we may or may not see changes immediately, but definitely the, the software development space is undergoing change. There's no question about it. And um, I, I know there was a big firm that was doing a project here in Canada, and uh, I don't remember which company it was. It, it may have been Capgemini or... Uh, it was definitely a company that had a uh, strong Indian presence, and they were saying that uh, because no code is new, there are some issues with getting security clearances and stuff like that. Um, but notwithstanding, they were able to build solutions uh, with uh, much lower time and cost. Next one is, will the success of no code jeopardize the AI and ML tools and cloud tools? Not really. I think no code will only complement AI and ML tools and cloud tools. That's that's my uh opinion and it's just one opinion there's you know lots of uh, points of view on that can elementary and high school children learn no code and build software for their study in games absolutely i think this is such a wonderful question and there was a pilot test in uh, in sweden in uh, summer of last year and a group of uh, uh, grade 12 or grade 10 students were asked to were given a, like a 2 hour uh, two-hour seminar and they were asked to build uh, some software with uh, no code. And the funny thing is that uh, they are all, all the kids are used to messaging each other. But as soon as they were able to send messages to each other with their own app, uh, they were really very excited because it's one thing to use an app to send a message to your friend, but uh, it's, sub it's so much more satisfying to actually build the software that sends the message to your friends. So that's a wonderful question. Absolutely, elementary and high school children, I think. So here's, here's the other angle, right? So learning no code actually starts uh, to build some foundations among children for systems thinking. They start to understand what databases are like, what database structures need to be like. And, and some of those kids might become more comfortable to learn coding because they started at, with no code. So we're seeing some of that as well, right? Next question is, how do we ensure quality in no code applications? Uh, how do we come across a limitation of rigid templates of no code software? Uh, very good question. Quality in no code applications. Um, I mean, there's there's no shortcut to, to quality in software, uh, testing, 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 and more testing is the only way to ensure quality, uh, whether you build something using code or no code. Uh, the second part of that question is, how do we come across the limitation of rigid templates of no code software? That's such an excellent question. So uh, just a bit of background. Um, 
a lot of the no code tools out there they come with templates so you can buy a template for let's say um let's say you can buy an airbnb template and customize it uh, to make your own your own version of airbnb let's say so if i understand the question correctly how do we overcome those limitations it's it's a hard one because someone who's built the template has had his or her own ideas on on what the functionality should be and what the database structure should be like with software there's really no one way to solve a problem right there are many different ways of solving the same problem so it's it's hard to it's hard to overcome those challenges of of a standard template uh my advice to my bootcamp students and other startups is that if you find a template and that template does most of what you want to do then weigh it as an option but if it doesn't do most of what it a template should ideally do at least 70 to 80% of the functionality that you're planning uh to introduce because if it if the template ends up uh satisfying less than let's say around 50% you'll find that it's very frustrating to build uh the application using a template you're better off not using a template in the first place um, yeah, the sap customization no before that we try to do that exercise how much is customizable and thing like that correct exactly so if it, if the customization required is too much then it's easier just to start with a with a blank sheet of paper So next question who's going to provide the functionalities for database input output and computation well if you're building an app for a user then the recommended way is to write user stories and try to flesh out the functionality and then take the user stories and then work backwards into the actual input output and database uh functionality because the user story i think has become the centerpiece uh to figure out what the yeah, an application should actually do right next question is bubble available only as cloud based delivery or on prem is possible unfortunately on prem is not available right now it's only cloud based at the moment next question what are the chances that mostly free tools will monetize at a later date this will obviously mean licensing selling customer data what's the trend so it's all of the above um free tools are definitely going to monetize at a later date if you have a if you're working with a tool that is free today you can be 100% sure that there's there is a pricing plan that's coming so um if i were you i would try to ask the vendor uh you know to give some early information some early guidance on pricing you don't want to invest a lot of time and energy and find out that you know what was supposed to be a free tool suddenly they want uh, you know $1000 a month or something like that um so some tools that remain free uh they have to find a way to recover their costs and make some money so if like they say right if something is free then you are the product uh with a lot of social media uh, tools like facebook and so on uh what is the, this is a common saying in the industry right we think the product is free but the product is actually not free because we are we ourselves are the product So uh in the no code space I tend to think that if there are tools that are mostly free they will they will end up uh with a price point at some point because I don't think the no code tool makers are too much into licensing or selling customer data. Uh next question please suggest no code package tools for developing apps for day to day household users and for locally owned small businesses. Bubble is a great solution for that. There's another one called Glide Apps which you can definitely check out. Uh very very simple, um easy to to use. It connects with Google Sheets at the back end. So anything for day to day household use. Um I'm actually uh a little bit busy but otherwise in my in my home we always have a struggle of uh, what is going to be cooked for breakfast, lunch and dinner. So that's a big problem for us. and uh, that's something that we are trying to uh, build a small app for um for just for household use so yeah glide apps or bubble is what i would suggest um next question and this is uh, three more questions so the next one is can uh can no code be delivered as a subset of one user experience to solve a problem facilitating integration with conventional system 
Absolutely. Absolutely. So if you have a conventional system, you have an existing system that's already operating, uh, you can very easily use no code to deliver just one piece of the user experience. Uh, I've seen that being done as well. And then you, you just use an integration tool to connect with your backend uh, to talk to any source of data that's sitting at the backend. And uh, so this approach is useful when, you know, you don't want to rebuild an entire system and an existing system uh, does not meet uh, some requirements. So yes, absolutely possible to do that. Uh, next one is, the next question is, as you, uh, as you had said, business users be able to use a no-code platform to build applications. Is this happening in startups only or SMBs? SMBs are also getting into the game. It's not just startups. Small and medium-sized businesses are also starting to see the value of no-code. But I have to say that it's slower in the SMB space. It's more prevalent in the startup space. Next question is, how strong are open source licenses in the context of monetizing codes apps? Um, in the no code space, we are still far away from open source. Open source has not really become uh, very prevalent because I think no code itself is a very nascent, very uh, infant stage um, trend right now. There's a lot being done with no code, but a lot of standards uh, will get established over a period of time. So at the moment, uh, I don't see anything happening in the open source space. Um, and there's a there's a question regarding pricing. So I, will the pre-monetized versions remain free of cost? It's hard. It's hard to tell. It really depends on the vendor. Some vendors uh, have a different strategy for pricing than others. Um, for me, I'm, for me, I find it difficult to see how a vendor would uh, keep a tool free of cost unless they have some other complementary product or unless they're a very large player like, let's say, Google or Amazon or uh, Microsoft where they can afford to uh, keep a tool free of cost indefinitely. It's, definitely not, it, it's uh, certainly not going to happen indefinitely. If there is... Um, a tool that's free of cost, it, in my opinion, it won't probably won't stay that way for for very long. So lots and lots of good questions. Uh, you know, yeah. I think there are few, there are a few more general questions I would like to ask. Yes, okay. absolutely. Yeah, one is that uh, scaling somebody's, up. Is, uh, sir, yeah. sorry to interrupt. Somebody's mic is on. I think I'm getting yeah. some. Yeah, yeah. I'm uh, Srinivasan ah, here. Srinivasan. We started the discussion before uh, you started the presentation. Yes, yes let, yes. let me compliment you for a very lucid presentation uh, of no code uh, solution today. But Thank we so could much. we could um, cover uh, more citizen development kind of a situation when it comes to enterprise grade uh, uh, no code mm. solutions. Mm. It's, a, it's a slightly different ball game in terms of uh, complexities involved, even in the no code system itself. And one of the most important advantage of no code in an enterprise solution is the ability to change the software to meet the changing business requirement that's something which users are finding it very very comfortable because when they think of something new they can get it going within a week's time 10 days time it's not going to take months and months before they can release a new version for a absolutely, new stage. absolutely. That's, a, that's one of the major benefit that we have experienced in implementing uh, enterprise grade um, no core solutions for large organizations that's of course has got a lot of many other uh, issues to be explained and taken mm -hmm. care of in terms of complexity of workflows integration to so many other facilities and so on but it's, a, it's something becoming reality it, it's, as you said it's going to take a little longer time one is lack of standards Second is to build the confidence of a, of, of a developer or, or a company which is uh, manufacturing it. It takes quite some time before we can get Microsofts and uh, people like that in the no-code domain also. So it's going to take some time. From that perspective of adapting to a, a new platform, which they are not aware of. So true, that's going true. to take some time. Yeah, that's what is a major uh, issue to be covered. The second challenge is to what you mentioned as things which cannot be done by no code, how much we can adapt them into the no code platform. 
for example our no code platform has got a complete layer on mixed reality which is a, which is something different the new technologies are evolving and the ability for a no code platform to adapt and include them in their uh, total solution uh, portfolio becomes important for no code to sustain and grow in the longer run absolutely I totally agree with you and i've i've also seen some some cases where um, you know there are some no code uh, tools available for uh, big data analytics for machine right. learning right right for right. artificial intelligence they are they are right. already there they already there again very very early uh, in in yeah. those in those yeah. spaces true true but just a matter of time i think uh, i think the more we abstract away from it the more business users are going to demand uh, you know point and click uh type of solutions that uh, that have very very short uh, turnaround times right and uh, yeah i i totally agree with you that's that's the direction in which we are right. headed right that's right mm-hmm. thank you thank, thank you dr thank you mr sinhasan for bringing out this enterprise uh, application yeah. development issue right right fact, uh, the associated problem what uh, generally we feel is about the shadow it so that is, that is the one which you know which is a major yeah. issue and particularly when the users start interfering with the uh, enterprise applications uh, i think that there, there is still there is uh, no proper solution for shadow it that's a there isn't the proper solution for for what yeah. shadow it shadow it i see so yeah. shadow it has always been a problem um and what uh, some enterprises are are hoping to achieve like stern's lending for example uh when we had those discussions what they hoping to achieve is that they hoping to uh to migrate shadow it projects into no code because at the end of the day the reason why some shadow it projects uh, exist inside enterprises is that uh some departments may be uh, may be impatient or not willing to wait for it teams to turn around solutions so they start their own uh, you know projects in the background so what stern's lending has has found and uh, among others is that by empowering users and saying okay instead of starting off an it project uh, you know in in your own department without communicating with the rest of the enterprise why not use a no code tool and make it widely available and improve the knowledge and access uh, of all the employees in the enterprise that's so it is something have. it is something like regularizing unauthorized construction yes that's right <laughs> <laughs> i couldn't have said it better yes it is, yeah, it is, it's very true uh, mohan <laughs> in fact one of the one of the common applications we have is uh, building uh, lot of utilities around the core banking solution for example yes no there are so many things done through spreadsheets everywhere yeah. <laughs> and putting them together in the no code solution around a, uh, an erp or a banking solution is that again is- a very 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 uh, popular requirement in most cases yeah. yeah absolutely and you know some people also believe that uh, and uh, that spreadsheets if they are depending on how they are used in some cases uh some people believe that spreadsheets are actually actually killing the a business or a department because yeah. uh it's an isolated island of knowledge and even yes. if uh, it's a shared document right, right. if somebody yeah. leaves the company or yeah. there's any turnover or changes in the people then that knowledge actually walks out from the front door and it's gone forever okay uh, so uh, yeah spreadsheets yeah. to no uh bajaj ja uh, i mean how is the documentation coming along with this uh, no code applications so in fact you develop an uh, application and then yeah. what type of documentation one we can uh, have it so that you know if someone wants to review or make changes and things like that are they available or uh, what are so ev- every tool seems to be handling it differently um like bubble has a uh, simple note taking feature where you know you can just take a few notes uh as in when you create a data source or a workflow or an element um and then uh, you know have those notes accessible so every every tool is implementing it in a different way but i think um no code doesn't take away the need to write good documentation that need uh, is yeah, no, always that, going to be uh, i mean that can still be a problem no because you of develop course. the app so fast and without realizing what you have done and ultimately it may put you into trouble that is the the documentation 
which is supposed to take care of these issues they will be missing that is one uh, one major problem and uh, we need to worry about it right yes so the human elements are not going to go away right the human elements are still going to be there and uh, it's just a matter of of creating best practices and creating uh the awareness among the people who are leading the project uh, and also of, finding the functionality in okay tool. in terms of uh, standard uh, sdlc this uh, no mm-hmm. code i mean software development uh, life cycle no this mm-hmm. uh, no code low code uh, which are the steps are uh, i mean uh, sort of jumped or avoided or will have to go through the same uh, sdlc steps so um what we're seeing more and more is uh, people want to first of all uh, employ agile methodology so that uh, you know they so some come some startups are doing sprints of 2 weeks so they'll uh, define some functionality and do one release every 2 weeks some want to release every week and then iterate based on on that one week sprint um and what i'm seeing at least here in in the toronto area and among the the companies that i consult with most of them want to start with the user story and work backwards from there right so they they want to start with writing detailed user stories and then discussing those user stories at great length before they even uh before they even uh, start you know they start, start the okay before starting anything yeah okay. uh i this uh, no code low code i said uh, something similar to the earlier you know we had a product rad products rapid application development mm-hmm. product how yep. do they compare are they are they similar in nature or uh, because ibm had the rad tools right yeah so i think uh, the no, the current generation no code tools are taking things one step further okay instead of from so, so... mainframe you know it has been extended to uh, Yeah. web and other uh, connected connected solutions basically right not only that so if you look at some of the rad tools that that were there uh, and uh, even exist till today is mm-hmm. they some of them did some prototyping or some wireframing or things like that where you could uh, you could have actually a working prototype you click the a few buttons and the screen changes or there's some navigation that's going on but in the no code space uh, what seems to be the focus mm-hmm. is that rather than building a prototype uh we end up building the actual uh solution itself right yep. so inside bubble for example uh although you can import a design that that's created on figma or envision or some other wireframing tools um but uh, if you use bubble uh, by itself or let's say even uh, betty blocks or some of these enterprise tools you're you're not just creating a prototype you can actually build uh the entire solution itself the entire working solution itself okay and there is a question regarding power apps by uh, google no so uh, Kiran, power Kiran, apps Kiran, yeah. power apps i believe is microsoft no uh, power apps is uh, yeah, yeah, Stray, power yeah apps microsoft, is microsoft and data microsoft. studio is from google apps that uh, yeah. how they how do they integrate between uh, these no code tools of different vendors do they integrate or you know you have to be in the same platform so all of the big players so microsoft google and amazon um as we as we know they prefer their own uh, their own ecosystem right so for instance app uh, app sheets from google most of the connectivity that comes naturally built into the platform is all google products uh same thing with power apps if you're using power apps you most of the of the data sources and and the uh, native uh, integration capabilities are within the microsoft ecosystem and i think that's understandable right these large companies have their strategy has always been that every product that they introduce into the market regardless of what it is whether it's a whether it's a you know spreadsheet tool or a phone or a or whatever it complements their existing ecosystem it um in some ways kind of prevents people from leaving their ecosystem and uh the the goal has has always been to build a walled garden yeah, for yeah. themselves yeah yeah but 
But at the end of the day, um, you know, their, even their customers, let's say a Microsoft customer is also going to demand that I should be able to use Power Apps and connect to a Google, my Google spreadsheet or my Google Drive sitting somewhere else or to, you know, a, a data source that's coming from Amazon. So whether even if they don't offer the capabilities now, sooner or later, and I, and I think they probably all of them do. So I, I haven't looked at all of them in detail, but I feel that they probably offer the ability to connect to uh, other data sources that are not not their own within their own ecosystem, but their preference is all, always going to be to connect to their own ecosystem, right? Yeah. Out of the yeah. box, uh, I think they'll probably favor their own ecosystem. Yeah. And uh, Bajaj, there was a feeling, you know, that when the calculators came up, the children were forgetting arithmetic tables, right? Right. So the uh, I mean the teachers and parents, you know, they are feeling that uh, children are losing their thinking capability and things like that. But you know now uh, entire world is uh, uh, promoting the STEM education, where the coding, learn the coding, is become one of the minimum aspect. Like everyone, you know, wants to be uh, knowing something about coding. So Correct. in this context, are we uh, uh, dampening the interest of coding uh, by no code, low code <laughs> developments? Um, I think, I think we were probably doing some, we're probably doing some disservice to coding along the way. But uh, like I said earlier, I think it depends on who you talk to. Like right in my own home, uh, the funny thing is that we have one coding professional and one no coding professional. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm the no code guy. My son is the code guy. So, okay. so we are at two opposite ends of the spectrum. He thinks uh, coding is not complex. What, what is the big deal? Why, why is all this fuss? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that I tried to learn coding, and coding was so hard for me to learn, especially uh, in the in the internet paradigm. So for me, no code has been a, a great a great way to express myself. Right. Mm -hmm. So. Um, but I think you're right. I, I don't think we, sh we should be careful not to send the wrong message. Coding is super, super important. And mm -hmm. uh, we, we cannot do without coders at all because everything we have today, including uh, no everything code platform itself on. is built on coding. <laughs> yeah, no code platforms <laughs> themselves yeah, built on coding. cannot exist without coding. Without so coding. coding will always be there. No, yeah. no doubt about it at all. But here's a here's a point. We are encouraging young people into STEM, and we're we're encouraging that people should learn coding. But um, in if you look at the coding space, and you know, you and I we probably experienced this. There are average. Uh, there are people who with average programming skills, and there are people with extraordinary programming skills. And the difference in productivity is is an order of magnitude. Right, some somebody who can write who's an excellent programmer can write probably high quality code maybe 10 20 times faster than someone else. That's one point. Second point is coding itself may be a hard thing for a lot of people, they may not uh, be able to climb that, that learning curve. So, let's say youngsters who, um, you know, who try their hand at coding but they find it extremely difficult. Now it's the end of the road for them. They can't really make computing a career. But no code actually opens the pathway for those people. But they what what about the, in terms of uh, compensation, salary compensation? This no code developer will they be compensated properly, or uh, you know, just uh, they will become like a low end uh, uh, people, like casual laborers and things like that? <laughs> <laughs> very good question. Very very good question. I wish I knew the answer to that. Um, so my my gut feeling is that along with no code, the world is also seeing so many other changes at the same time. We've seen, uh, you know, globalization of services and um, and a reset in the last one year with uh, with regard to with regard to um, the the most recent one year that we've had with COVID and all of that. So I think there's a lot of other factors at play as well, right? There's a lot more outsourcing going on. There's a lot more 
businesses are you know uh, reaching out to low cost countries for all sorts of services not just for coding okay. is there any yes. uh, any way that we can assess the skill of a uh, no code low code developer so basically you know uh, we can do the assessment of a coder programmer but yes. in this case how will you assess the uh, capabilities again such an excellent question because there are no standards because every tool is different it all comes down to which tool you plan to use in the enterprise and uh, maybe you can do a you can do a, a a test using that tool just like uh, coding tests that are become very common for the interview stage right uh, so you can ask an applicant to uh, you know give them a problem and ask them to to build a solution using the no code tool that that the specific tool that you're hiring for so ultimately it becomes like a hackathon exercise <laughs> yeah something, okay. something like a hackathon because uh, nowadays uh, software developers are uh, most of the time are not being hired unless they yeah. finish their coding test correct correct so correct. and then there is one question regarding uh, this no code application development platform are they available for iot applications like you know the interfacing with sensors and scientific uh, thing you know basically this routine database and then you know e-commerce some of the general uh, commercial applications are fine but do they have any uh, scope for extending to iot and and the sensor based applications basically the critical applications like mission yeah. critical so some manufacturers in the sensor world and the iot world are also waking up to the fact that uh, they are limiting themselves if they only offer a coding approach to talk to those devices right so they're waking up to that fact so i've seen one or two examples of some iot manufacturers that are offering a no code uh, drag and drop tool uh, to to talk to those sensors and integrate data coming from them into uh, you know some other app so it is happening it is happening but not not as fast as the routine uh, database type of applications but no, it is basically the ro- robustness uh, robustness you know becomes one of the issue in terms of critical applications if something you know not tested properly or maybe you know it has got some loose ends the damage what it can create will be very uh, substantial that yes. that be then where they may not like to use their no code and things like that in terms of uh, scaling up no code application you know are there any issues to scale up the no code application are they limited to only doing some small applications or uh, a large uh, database is there any restrictions so at the enterprise level uh, there are few restrictions a um, lot of these a lot of these uh, enterprise no code tools are able to scale very well but uh, as you look at the smaller so the answer is depends on the on the tool some tools are able to scale better than others um and when it comes to scalability with the uh, bubble let's say it it depends on how the software is built um that also has some you know some uh, implication on performance but uh, they also have an upgrade path so you can actually add more server capacity you can add you can move all the way up to a dedicated server if if you want to so using just bubble as an example they offer a growth path so if your data volume start to increase then you can add server capacity also move on to a dedicated server and um yeah so it so it depends on the app and it depends on the no code tool but for a lot of startups uh, you know at least initially the first couple of years they don't they're not really worried about scalability because they're not going to probably not going to have billions of users And uh, so, at least it's a good start. Okay. And uh, one last question is regarding uh, uh, deploying the no code, low code application. Uh, I mean, uh, can it be? You are mentioning that you know it can be deployed in various platforms like uh, web and uh, mobile and so on, things like that. Yes. Are these to be predefined in uh, while de- developing, or you know, once you develop and then the deployment can take care the platform. how does it uh, are you have to specifically predefine in advance in what platform you know you are planning or something like that. or a single 
code develop or single app develop can it be deployed in multiple uh, platforms so all of the above uh, in most cases what i've seen is that um, a good practice is to actually predefine where you where you're going to deploy it not just from a technical point of view but also i think from a user experience point of view it's critical to define where the app will be developed simply because the amount of real estate that you have to define and draw the the user interface uh, screens is entirely different and uh, how you want the application to respond from a from a desktop to a mobile and uh, you know how you're going to compress the the information onto a smaller screen uh, is also important so you can so in some with some no code tools like bubble for example you can build a responsive app which responds to the size of the user's device uh, and continue to remain a web app but in uh, the case of adalo for example you can build a web <coughs> app and a mobile app uh, both versions for the ios and play store at the same time so you have essentially one single code base that can be deployed to the web and to both the app stores uh, so i think it's important to understand where your users are are they mostly desktop or mobile and then and then have some planning exercise ahead of time so okay. that a the screens can be designed accordingly and b you choose the right tool uh, for the project and and see um, you know you're actually able, able to deploy it uh, according to the plan okay thank you thank you mr bajaj for a excellent presentation and demo and as well as the, the interactive q and a you know it's been you know, various uh, issues were raised and then you were uh, provide you were providing a very comprehensive and acceptable uh, a reasonably acceptable solutions <laughs> you're most welcome yeah it was uh, i i'm really happy with with so many questions yeah yeah so uh, quite convincing replies also of course uh, to a Thank large you. extent you know, they were all convincing so on behalf of the iwp computer society acm and csi i'd like to extend once again our sincere thanks for uh, your time and effort in making this presentation uh, uh, a mem- memorable one and uh, before uh, we complete uh, uh, today's session just want to uh, make some announcement regarding our forthcoming programs is one on uh, 24th we have a program on demystifying cryptography and uh, encryption algorithms on 27th uh, we have uh, a program on uh, uh, writing uh, a good thesis and uh, sort of uh, ethical uh, reports and then others uh, more on uh, paper writing and plagiarism and things like that in the first week of april you know we have a performance appraisal in the uh, covid and work from uh, home scenario you know how the performance of uh, individuals are being appraised so this is a contextual topic and 10th of uh, next month april you know we have a program on uh, various uh, platforms uh, how to develop applications in blockchain basically you know for enterprise application developing uh, enterprise application using blockchain so these are our forthcoming webinars and we have sent announcements please do register and attend them so with this uh, we'll formally uh, close our today's session and uh, our thanks to bajaj on second thank you bajaj Th- thank you to uh, sir thank you i've uh, really enjoyed uh, uh, being here and and presenting this topic to your audience okay good night to everyone see you Kiran, anything else? Yes. Yeah. All well. Yeah. All well. <laughs> Good job. Well done. Yeah. Kiran, Bajaj, you have Hiran. mentioned no. Kiran is. Yes. Kiran, how are how are you doing? How are you doing? How are you doing? Good to see you. I'll sorry, put on the camera. Yeah. I saw you last week, but I couldn't talk to you. So. Okay. <laughs> Let me stop my screen share as well.